Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today we begin a short study in the Old Testament book of Zephaniah. How many people can say that? (laughs) Well, today, Zephaniah isn't exactly what some would call encouraging. In fact, many say that its message seems really rather harsh and cruel. Well, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, turns his thinking upside down as he explains to us what's called the dark side of love. So why don't you go ahead and turn to Zephaniah chapter 1, and while you do, Greg and I have got a letter that we want to share with you. Yeah, Steve, once in a while we get these letters that give us a much deeper picture of how God uses us as a link in the chain to help other people minister. And we do just want to remind people that Dr. McGee told us we should be fruit inspectors. And the reason Mm -hmm. we read these letters is to encourage all of us in a couple things. One is, if you support this ministry, there is a ton of fruit. And the second is, maybe there's something that God is doing in this person's life that they, he might want to do in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start. This is, this is Pamela from South Carolina. Dear Bible bus riders, that's nice, she addresses it to everyone. all of us. For the past six plus years, I have been so blessed in listening to Through the Bible on the app nearly daily. I took a tour of Panama in March and met a dear believer from India who works in a high-risk area in Africa. Wow. (laughs) By God's providence, we were both added to the tour after others canceled. This brother has no fellowship or church to attend in Africa, so he was excited to meet another Christian. I told him about your app in over 120 languages. She's listening, Steve. She is. <laughs> he downloaded it and opened it to his mother tongue of Telugu. I wish you could have seen his face light up in excitement when he heard the speaker. He recognized his voice immediately and said he is a well-known evangelist who made the tapes about 30 years ago. <laughs> Two days later, we parted ways. Greg, why don't you pick it up from there? Yeah, and I just want to point out, this is a lady from South Carolina who's traveling in Panama who meets a man from India who works in Africa, just to kind yeah. of keep track of this <laughs> rather that, you know, that we need like and, one of those maps with the, the and, line. And recognizes our producer's voice of Through the Bible yeah. and Telugu. Amazing, amazing. She goes on, I had to return early to South Carolina because of COVID-19, and my new brother was on the last flight out of Panama to Paris and back to Africa. Man. These people are circling the globe. She goes on, we both quarantined for three weeks and tested negative for COVID. Well, we thank God for that. She says, we started talking on WhatsApp twice a week and decided to study a Bible chapter together every time. Mm. (laughs) This is amazing. We answer 10 questions on our own and read each chapter 10 times. Okay. I am, I'm feeling a little bit challenged right now. She says, then I listen to Dr. McGee in English and he listens to the chapter in Telugu. When we talk, we always start in prayer and ask the Lord to teach us. And then we end in prayer to lock the truths into our hearts. We are both growing tremendously through this method. He is quarantined until the end of June. Of course, this came a while back. Yep. And I am retired, so our quarantine Bible school continues. They don't listen to any letters from other listeners in Telugu, so I forward my World Prayer Team emails to him. He delights in reading about people receiving Christ and growing, especially in India and Africa. And Steve, why don't you close out this great letter. Sure. I also thank the Lord I can put some gas in the tank monthly and have included TTB in my will in case the Lord takes me home before the rapture. One thing I love about TTB is that it will never go off doctrinally because Dr. McGee is home with the Lord. The word of God is timeless, and yet the messages are always up to date for my daily needs. Let's all keep looking unto Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> and Steve, we don't have enough time to pull out all the gems that are in that letter, yeah. but I hope that all of our listening family who she wrote this letter to, the, the Bible bus writers, are encouraged by this. Yeah, it is It is such an encouragement at so many different levels. I mean, we talk about our small group Bible studies happening in one continent, and this is happening intercontinentally <laughs> between languages, and it's a small group Bible study. It's incredible. It's wonderful. <laughs> Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin our study in Zephaniah? 
Father, thank you for the joy and the enjoyment of seeing you work in in just a staggering way in the life of, of our dear sister who rides the Bible bus with us every day and this brother from India who lives in Africa. Only you could put together such a, a beautiful tapestry, and we thank you for that. We pray you would continue to run freely in power and, and goodness in the lives of our listeners around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We come now to the little book of Zephaniah. I told you at the beginning when we took up Nahum that we were putting together three remarkable little books, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And I'm sure that most of you now agree that the first two books, Nahum and Habakkuk, are unusual books. Well, Zephaniah is not far behind. In fact, it's not behind at all. It's another remarkable book that we've come to. Now, I do not think the little book of Zephaniah will ever take the place of John 3.16 or the gospel of John as number one in Bible popularity. But the contents of this little book have never been familiar. I doubt whether the little book's been read very much. I'm going to ask a question that I asked a long time ago regarding another book, and that is, how many of you have ever heard a sermon on Zephaniah? I dare say that few of you have ever done that. I asked that question several years ago when I was pastor one Sunday morning when I was going to preach on it, and out of a congregation of between 2,500 and 3,000, there were probably two hands that were put up that had heard a sermon on Zephaniah. Now, that's not due to the mediocrity or the inferiority of this little book, I can assure you, but it's been neglected because actually its theme was known, I think it would be appreciated, and that is it has the same theme as the Gospel of John has. John is called the Apostle of Love. And he is an apostle of love. But we come to a little book, and he is the prophet of love. Now, it's going to be difficult for you to believe that. It's hard to believe it. But let me give you a verse from that. We're acquainted with John 3.16. How about Zephaniah 3.17? Listen to this. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save He'll rejoice over thee with joy. He'll rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. He'll rest in his love. Lovely, isn't it? Well, may I say to you, this little book is a little different, though, than the Gospel of John. This verse I've given you is just like a small island that is sheltered in the midst of a storm-tossed sea. Because much of this little book of Zephaniah seems rather harsh and cruel. It seems like it's fury poured out. And the reason for that is there's just too much judgment that's in this little book here. He begins chapter 3 of Zephaniah with, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. And my, starts out in that vein, and that's not very popular today. Now, how can love be the theme? It's like looking for the proverbial needle in the haystack. I think I can illustrate this by telling you a detective story, giving you a mystery story. Now, that seems a very peculiar way to begin Zephaniah, but let me give you a mystery story here, and it's going to help us understand this little book. Now, I want to brief you here on the very terrifying scene, by the way. And we are going to look now at the dark side of love. Now, here is my story. It was late at night in a suburban area of one of our great cities of America. A child lay restless in her bed, a man with a very severe and stern look. He stealthily, entered a bedroom, and he softly approached her bed. And the moment the little girl saw him, 
a terrified look came over her face and she began to scream. And her mother rushed into the room and went over to her and the trembling child threw her arms about her. But the man withdrew to the telephone and he called someone who was evidently an accomplice and in a very soft voice made some sort of an arrangement. And hastily, the man re-entered the room. He tore the child from the mother's arms and he rushed out to a waiting car and the child was sobbing and he attempted to stifle her cries. He drove madly down street after street until he finally pulled up before a large, sinister and foreboding-looking building. All was quiet. The building was partially dark, but there was one room upstairs ablaze with light, and the child was hurriedly taken inside, up to the lighted room, and put into the hands of the man with whom the conversation had been held over the telephone in the hallway. In turn, the child was handed over to another accomplice, and this time it was a woman. And these two took her into an inner room, and the man who had brought her was left outside in the hallway. Inside the room, the man that took her in there, he took a long, sharp, gleaming knife, and he plunged it into the vitals of that little child and she lay as if she were dead. Now, I wonder what your reaction is at this point. Maybe you're saying, well, I certainly hope they'll catch that criminal who abducted that little child and is responsible for such an awful crime. May I say to you, friends, I have not described to you the depraved and degraded action of a debased mind. I've not taken a chapter out of the life of a man in cell 2455, death row. I haven't told you a story that comes from one of these murder mysteries that we have too much probably on TV today. I have not related to you the sordid and sadistic crime of a psychopathic criminal. On the contrary, I have described to you a tender act of love. In fact, I can think of no more sincere demonstration of love than I've described to you. Now, I'm sure you're amazed when I say that. Now, let me fill in here, and then you'll understand. You see, that little girl had awakened in the night with severe abdominal pains. She had been subject to such attacks, and her parents were watching her very carefully, the doctor had said to do that. And it was actually her father who had rushed into the room. And the little girl knew that she might have to make that trip to the hospital. And when the father rushed into the room, she screamed, of course. And he talked to the specialist about it. And when he saw the suffering of the little girl, you see, he went to the telephone, he called the family physician, and he arranged to meet him at the hospital. And he had rushed his own little girl, down to the hospital, and he handed her over to the family physician. And the doctor had taken her into the operating room with the nurse, and he performed an emergency surgery. Through it all, every move and every act of that father was of tender love, anxious care, and a wise decision. I have described to you the dark side of love, but love nevertheless. Now, the father loved that child just as much on that dark night when he took her to the hospital and delivered her to the surgeon's knife as he did the next week when he brought her flowers and candy. It was just as much a demonstration of deep affection when he delivered her into the hands of the surgeon as it was the next week when he brought her home and delivered her into the arms of her mother. My friend, love places the eternal security and permanent welfare of the object of love above any transitory or temporary comfort, our present pleasure, 
down here upon this earth. In other words, love seeks the best interests of the beloved. That's important. That's what this little book of Zephaniah is all about. It's the dark side of love. Now, let me move on here. Now, in our nation today, we have come through a period when the love of God has been exaggerated out of all proportion to the other attributes of our God. And it's been presented in such a way that the love of God is a weakness rather than a strength. It has been presented on the sunny side of the street with nothing of the other side ever mentioned. There is a love of God presented that sounds to me like the doting of grandparents rather than the vital and vigorous concern of a parent for the best interests of the child. The liberal preacher today is chanted like a parrot. He has used shop-worn cliches. He's taken tired adjectives, and he said, God is love, God is love, God is love, until he's made it saccharine sweet. And he has not told about the dark side of the love of God. He has watered love down, making it sickening rather than stimulating, causing it to slop over on every side like a sentimental feeling rather than an abiding concern for the object of love. Now, let me add this. God deals with us according to our need. I want you to notice that there is the dark side of the love of God. The great physician will put his child on the operating table, and he'll use the surgeon's knife when he sees a tumor of transgression or a deadly virus sapping our spiritual lives or when he sees the cancerous growth of sin. He does not hesitate to deal with us severely. We must learn this fact early. He loves us just as much when he's subjecting us to surgery as when he sends us candy and flowers and brings us into the sunshine. And sometimes the great physician will operate without giving us so much as a sedative. But you can always be sure of one thing. When he does this, he'll pour in the balm of Gilead when he sees that it is best for you and for me to go down through the valley of suffering, that it will be for our eternal welfare, he'll not hesitate to let us go down through the dark valley. Someone has expressed it in these lines. Is there no other way, O God, except through sorrow, pain, and loss, to stamp Christ's likeness on my soul? No other way except the cross? And then a voice stills all my soul, as still the waves of Galilee. Canst thou not bear the furnace, if midst the flames I walk with thee? I bore the cross, I know its weight, I drank the cup I hold for thee. Canst thou not follow where I lead? I'll give thee strength, lean hard on me. My friend, He loves us most when he's operating on us. That's what we saw, you remember, back in Hebrews 12, 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, he child trains, he disciplines. And there's another figure that the Lord Jesus presented yonder in the upper room, and you will find that in the gospel of John, the gospel of love. John 15, verses 1 and 2. He says, I'm the genuine vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. May I say to you, we must remember that the father reaches into your life and mine and prunes out that which is not fruit bearing, and it hurts. But as a Puritan divine once said years ago, the husbandman is never so close to the branch as when he's trimming it. The father is never more close to you, my friend, than when he's reaching in and taking out of your heart and life those things that offend. It was Spurgeon 
who noticed a weather vane that a farmer had on his barn. It was an unusual weather vane, for on it the farmer had the words, God is love. And Mr. Spurgeon asked him, he says, do you mean by this that God's love is as changeable as the wind? The farmer shook his head. No, he said, I do not mean that God's love changes like that. I mean that whichever way the wind blows, God is love. Today it may be the soft wind from the south that he brings to blow across your life, for he loves you. And tomorrow he may let the cold blasts from the north blow over your life, and if he does, he still loves you. It has been expressed in a very wonderful poem, and I've used it before. I hesitate to use it again. But I want to bring out this point. God hath not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He hath not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. And then I lift out the last stanza. But God hath promised strength for the day rest for the laborer, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. Beloved, if you are a child of God and you're in a place of suffering, be assured and know that God loves you, regardless of how it may appear. He loves you, and you can't ever change that. And that's what we have now in the little prophecy of Zephaniah. It sets forth the dark side of the love of God. I have a notion that very few of you, when I asked the question a moment ago, had you ever heard a sermon on Zephaniah? Very few of you, I'm sure, would have put up your hand. And since it presents the dark side of God's love, I can well understand how it would be unpopular because it opens with rumblings of judgment the judgment of God that's coming upon this earth. And you find that as we get into it, this little book. But I want to say something now in closing, just this one word about the writer of this little book, because it's pretty important for us to get acquainted with him and know him, because he introduces himself. You see, Zephaniah identified himself better than any of the other minor prophets. Now, we have been looking at Habakkuk. Actually, Habakkuk concealed himself in silence. We know nothing about his background, but Zephaniah went to the opposite extreme, and he told us more than's ordinary. He traced his lineage back to his great-great-grandfather, who was Hezekiah, whom we know as Hezekiah, king of Judah. In other words, he was of the royal line. So, Let's just get our foot in the door of the book before we get through today. I read verse 1. The word of the Lord, which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Jedeliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So he not only told us about himself and his lineage, but he tells us at the time that he wrote. And it was a dark day for the nation. According to the arrangement of the Hebrew Scriptures, Zephaniah was the last of the prophets before the captivity. He was contemporary with Jeremiah, and probably he could have been, I guess, with Micah, but I doubt that. His was the swan song of the Davidic kingdom, and he's credited with giving impetus to the revival during the reign of Josiah. And we're going to see in this little book, sweetness and light, that's ordinarily associated with love on every level, and I think rightly so, but this aspect actually does not exhaust the full import of love. Love expresses itself always for the good of the one who is loved, always. That's what real love is. Love is kind. This is the reason 
that it's difficult to associate love with the judgment of God. And so many people think of God as if he's a sort of a super Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. One nature of his is expressed by love, and the other nature is expressed in wrath by judgment. And these two appear to be contrary to the extent there seems to be actually two gods. Well, Zephaniah is filled with the wrath and judgment of God, but there is the undertone of the love of God. And that is the story we told you today, that dark side of love. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. And so in God's love, we pray that you go into your day with the confidence that God is at work in your life. If we can help you find a resource that deepens your study of God's Word, just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'll meet you back here tomorrow. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.